Happy Sabbath once more. And we are going to get right into the subject matter for today. We've got a lot to cover, but I want to make sure it's digestible. Amen? <laughs> so to do that, we're going to have to move a little bit slowly because I want you to truly learn a lot today, not only about health, but about simple things that you can do to improve your health. I want you to learn about your body. I want you to learn about how fearfully and wonderfully God has made each and every one of us. And my goal is by the time that we're finished, we're all going to be having many, many more reasons to give God glory and give God praise after the, the series is finished. So let's go ahead and get started. Let's start um, with a song, in fact, right here. This is a purposeful song. I'm not just having you sing this for any reason, but for a very specific reason. Anyone know this scripture song? A Merry Heart, Proverbs 17, 22. Okay, we're going to sing this together. Amen? So I'm not going to be the only one singing. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and sing. And then we're going to sing it a couple times through because this is actually very important. All right. A merry heart, do it with the like a Let's sing it one more time. This, is, this has a very, very important Amen. message attached to it, actually in, built into it. Mind and you. I'll tell you, if you don't sing it now, you're going to be so sad <laughs> when we're finished. You're going to think, I should have sang that song. So this is your chance right now. Let's do it once more. A merry heart, do it the better already. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Well, you know, I told you there is a real reason why we chose this song to sing in the intro. And as we go through the, this presentation, we're going to have two presentations today. Um, as we go through this presentation in particular, you're going to eventually realize that this just did you good like a medicine. And it's profound. It's not just like a little pat on the back. It's actually amazingly beneficial, okay? So we're actually going to be looking at our immune system uh, today. This is actually from a presentation series called Viral. Uh, I know that I mentioned I was going to be talking about Simply Amazing Health, and this is basically Simply Amazing Health. I have a whole other series. It's a nine-part series called Simply Amazing Health, and we're going to talk about uh, one of those nine parts after this presentation. But I thought I would be neglectful if I told you to prepare your immune system during the divine hour and I didn't tell you how to do it later on. Amen? So we're going to learn how we can do this together. But first I want to give you a, a definition. Have you ever heard of the phrase go viral? Anyone? What does it refer to? Spread. Using social media, right? The dictionary definition is of a video, image, story, etc. to spread quickly and widely among internet users via social networking sites, email, etc. So this is something that spreads very quickly. We know what viral means because we've experienced what viral things do. They spread like a virus. They spread like wildfire. They announce information or videos or whatever it may be in a very short amount of time to a very large amount of people. But you know where the word viral originally came from? Viruses, right? Not such a good thing. But you know what? Viruses are very good at spreading virally. 
That's where we get that whole viral concept from. I'll submit to you that it's time for God's people to spread the health message in a viral way. You know why? Because diseases are outpacing our efforts right now. And we need the gift of the Holy Spirit so that we can start outpacing disease. Because this world really needs it. And I want to show you just a short little diagram how fast viruses spread. Just to give you an idea, I believe, of how fast we need to spread this message. Maybe even faster. This is um, uh, actually a little map from the CDC showing the spread of influenza during one season. This is the 2014 season. Now I'm going to show you very quickly, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but if you look at the red, that's high levels of influenza-like activity. So where's the influenza right now in October of 2014? It's in Puerto Rico, right? All right, now watch what happens. What's going on now? It's starting to catch on, right? Did you see that? Let's go back there. By the time we get high levels of influenza in Mississippi, the nation is doomed in terms of influenza. Once you get a foothold, once a virus gets a foothold like that, you know what's going to happen? Guess. Very quickly, the whole country, within a couple weeks, the whole country has got influenza. That's pretty fast, isn't it? So let me ask you a question. When is it time to start sharing with your neighbors about health and wellness? When is it time to start learning ourselves about health and wellness? Is it when we see that uh, the neighboring state has a big viral epidemic? Then it could be too late. Now, still, there's still steps to take, amen? If you see it, you know, even at the door, yeah, you can still take steps. But brothers and sisters, we can see these things a far way off sometimes too, and God still wants to give us the preparatory time to get ready for them. Amen? Amen. And so we're going to be looking at how we can do that. Okay, what is this? That's a virus. That is our enemy. In, case, in the case of this, it's an artist's rendition of the influenza virus. Now, as we talked about this morning, there are many viruses that are really becoming uh, more and more rampant and more and more deadly even in the world today. But did you know that God has given us equipage to combat any viral attacker that is ever uh, posed as a threat to us? Did you realize that? It's absolutely amazing. Anyone heard of Ebola? Now, that's a pretty deadly disease, right? The Zaire Ebola virus, at least the last outbreak, was killing about 60% estimates, 60% or maybe a little bit less of all the people that came down with the Ebola virus. That's pretty deadly, isn't it? But did you realize that each one of those persons could have fought off the Ebola virus? You know why? Scientists have been studying Ebola since 1976, and they've yet to find a solid um, remedy or cure for Ebola. However, they have found some pretty interesting things in the natural world. But the most remarkable thing they found was this right here, this one study that was published in actually 2004. What they found was that if we were able to strengthen our immune system, in particular the natural killer cells, which are a certain type of immune cell, Ebola did not stand a chance against the human immune army. Absolutely amazing. Praise God. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. And you know what? Other studies have found influenza doesn't stand a chance when these natural killer cells are functioning properly. So if you're worried about the next hundred years flu, what do we need to do? We need to get these little guys healthy, right? We have billions of them in the body, usually, but sometimes we have less or more, depending actually on the choices that you and I make. They're very, very fragile in terms of some of the choices, the lifestyle choices we make. So, what I'd like to do today is not just talk about one particular immune cell, but let's get a broad overview. And let's understand what we can do to benefit all of the immune system so that we can actually help ourselves not get sick. Does that sound like a good idea? Okay. So this is entitled The Army 
within. In brief, uh, just go through these real quick. We're going to talk about these eight immune cells. The neutrophil, eosinophil, basophil, monocyte, T cell, B cell, natural killer cell, and macrophage. Don't worry about memorizing the names because we're going to talk about each one individually. But before we do that, I want to tell you where they come from because these cells don't just, they just don't come out of the blue. They actually have a set location in the body where they develop from and they have set purposes. So starting with this stem cell right here, this is not the stem cell we talked about last night, but it's a stem cell that lives in the bone marrow. What this stem cell does is it can turn into these types of cells right here, these here or these here. These are your um, blood cells such as the platelets um, or the platelet producing cell and the platelets, the red blood cells and then all of these other different types of immune um, cells and then over here we have the B and T lymphocytes and the natural killer cells. So from this one cell, where do all these cells come from? Right here. Just one cell. Where does that cell live? Does anyone remember? In the bone marrow. Okay, that's a very important thing to remember. Here's another look right here. Quite remarkable. Do you think these cells are important? Absolutely. If something goes wrong with these cells, you know what you develop? Cancer, leukemia, or a lymphoma. If something goes wrong here or here. This could be a leukemia, this could be a lymphoma. Um, so it's very important for us to protect these cells. Here's another look. And we know how important red blood cells are and the, uh, of course, the platelets and the white blood cells. But they all come from this one cell that resides in the bone marrow. Okay, now that I made that point, let's go into our first immune cell which is the neutrophil. The neutrophil is the most common immune cell in the body in, under normal circumstances. You usually have about 60% uh, ratio of these immune cells to other types of white blood cells. So they're the most predominant white blood cells. What do they do? Well, let's say you get a cut or you get a scrape. You know what little organisms are all around us and even on the skin? bacteria and fungus, right? And so let's say you get a cut and you get some bacteria in there in that cut. What potentially could those bacteria do? They could replicate, they could increase in numbers and they could cause an infection. Now that sounds like something that could happen pretty frequently, correct? Very easy for us to fall down and get a cut um, or to have some bacterial invasion or fungal invasion of the skin. That's why neutrophils are in such high demand initially. And so what a neutrophil will do is it will come into an area, and actually show you this diagram. It will come into an area and it will have supper. Okay, so this is the bacteria or the fungus. And the neutrophil will come over it will, find, it will kind of identify it as being something foreign and it, you know what it will do? What's going on here? It eats it, right? That's pretty amazing. Now, you may think, well, yeah, you know, that's just like a run-of-the-mill skin-dwelling bacteria. Um, but I want to show you a picture of what neutrophils are capable of. Does anyone know what this bacteria is that a neutrophil is eating? It's anthrax. Can you believe it? These cells can eat anthrax. They can destroy anthrax. So neutrophils are important and they're very highly capable little soldiers to take care of bacteria. We can learn a lot about um, how we should interact with others by looking at our body and looking how the body, the different members, the different cells of the body interact with each other. And uh, this is an example right here, what we see happening. You can't see it real well, but these are different cells in a tissue group. And this is the bloodstream right here. There are red blood cells and there are neutrophils that are passing through the bloodstream. 
what happens sometimes is you will get some bacteria in certain tissue groups. And so this neutrophil has found some bacteria. Do you, do you see what he's doing? He's eating them, correct? But he's not going to enjoy this meal by himself. You know what he's going to do? He sends out a chemical messenger. It's called interleukin-8. And what interleukin-8 does is it kind of wafts and permeates through the tissue, makes its way over to the bloodstream, penetrates in through the blood vessel, and now all those neutrophils going by say, hey, free meal. And then they go into the tissue group and they actually um, help to partake of this bacteria supper or lunch or breakfast, however, whatever it may be. I just think that's pretty amazing. And you know, another interesting thing about it is when neutrophils make the commitment to go into an area and to do the job, they never stop that commitment. They'll go into a tissue group and they'll die there. They'll stay there until their work is done. They will never leave that area. They make a commitment and they're solid with it. Praise God for these character qualities. Amen? I mean, what if you had a neutrophil who was kind of, um, kind of wavering? Maybe I should stay, maybe I should go, and he just abandons the army. Aren't you glad that God has placed these strong traits of character in these immune cells? I am too. And these are not the only traits of character that we'll see in these immune cells. Just amazing. Okay, next cell is the basophil. You might not like the basophil. In fact, you may be warring against the basophil on a day-to-day -day basis. You know the reason why? Because the basophil is what we would call in the armed forces a transportation specialist. What do you think he helps to do? He helps to ensure troop movement, right? From one place to another. Do you know how he does that? He does it by producing something called histamine. Now you know what I'm talking about, right? Who likes histamine? Nobody likes histamine. But I'll tell you, without histamine, at least in, in moderate levels, without histamine, your immune system is not going to be able to be mobilized as readily to fight invaders. Now, a lot of us have these overactive histamine responses, like with allergies and that kind of thing. And that's when histamine really bu bugs us and it bothers us. I'll submit to you, there are some simple natural ways that you can lower histamine response. And I can show you those. I don't have them with me right now. How many of you want to know at least one thing, though? OK, here's one thing. Quite amazing. Drink more water. <laughs> Just drinking water will help to flush out any overactive chemical in the body. Why is that? Because water purifies. We take a shower with water, right? We wash dirt off of our skin, but internally water purifies the, the, the fluids. We're 60 to 70 percent water by, uh, we're 60 percent water by volume, or 60 by weight, 70 by volume, or I might have it mixed up, but we're mostly water. And a lot of our tissue groups are, are a high percentage of water, such as the lungs, they're 90 percent water. So you can imagine, if we start to get dehydrated, what's going to happen? Histamine will actually have a greater impact because it's more concentrated. So you've heard the old adage, the solution to pollution is dilution. Well, I'm not recommending that, but let's dilute the histamine levels. And water is going to help not only with dilution of histamine, but also getting the allergens, the, the allergy-causing um, proteins out of the system. Okay, and there are many others, too, we could talk about. I'll, I'll actually make it a point to bring up a few more in the, in the next lecture. Well, let's go on here. Um, these cells do produce histamine, so what histamine does, in brief, I'll show you right here. It's kind of similar to what we saw before, but this is an exact diagram showing you what histamine is going to do. These are the cells that need to come in and eat up the bacteria, and these are neutrophils in this case. But there is a capillary wall, or there are tissue groups that are tightly joined together. That's another character quality, amen? of our church. Should we be tightly joined together? We should be knit together in brotherly love. Amen? And that's what the, the tissue groups are. You know what happens when cells are broken apart and they're just kind of, they don't like to stick together? You know what we call that? We call that cancer. Cancerous tissues do not stick together. 
They hate each other. They're like, they're like a bean bag. Beans in a bean bag. They'll go any which way. They don't stick together. They don't have that cellular cohesion that normal tissue groups have. So in the body of Christ, that should be a lesson. Amen? You see the connection, right? So we need to love each other if we're going to stick together and function correctly as a body. Okay, so let's take a look and see what happens when histamine is um, increased. Normally, the white blood cells can make their way through. They're, they can squeeze through very tight um, uh, passageways, and that's what they're doing right here and going into this area where they can eat the bacteria. But what histamine does is it opens those junctions a little bit more so that white blood cells can go in very quickly into the area. Now, what do you think that does if you have open junctions in your sinuses? You start to get watery nose, watery eyes, right? And then what do we do? We take an antihistamine, say, no thank you, that's inconvenient for me, right? I'll tell you, in some ways I grew up on antihistamines. And I was taking anatomy and physiology at a college just a few miles away from here. And uh, when my professor told me about the basophil, and he told me about histamine, I made a beeline down to see him as soon as I, his lecture was finished. And I said, tell me, I've been on antihistamines for most of my life. Have I been decreasing the function of my immune system? He looked at me and said, of course, obviously. Because this is an important thing for, for our bodies to be able to fight disease. Uh, since then, I've tried to find other ways of dealing with histamine. Okay, so let's go on here. Now that you see that histamine is an important thing in moderate doses. Here's an interesting cell. It's known as the eosinophil. What is eosinophil? What does he do? Well, it's pretty amazing because this cell is kind of like Caleb in the Bible. What was Caleb's request from Joshua when they were entering back into Canaan and they were, gonna, they were basically going to... Um, get rid of, they were going to have a conquest of Canaan. He said, give me the mountain of the what? Of the giants, the Anakims. Amen? Was he afraid of going after the big guys? No. Why? Because he said, the Lord is with me. These little cells have that same character quality. They go after the parasites. Okay? They go after the, the large, or the, the immune-causing um, compounds as well. And I'll tell you, they don't live very long. They live anywhere from 8 to 12 days. And as a general rule, the immune system um, is very short-lived. The cells are very short-lived. Why are they short-lived? Well, because they're active. They're seeking not their own benefit, because they know if they inv invade an area or they become active, they don't have very long to live. They can be dormant for a number of years, especially things like the B lymphocytes, tens of years, scores of years even. So when they become active, they don't live very long, but you know what? There's an important principle there. The Bible says, greater love hath no man than this, than he lay down his life for his friends. Your immune cells love you. And they show it to us on a microscopic level because they're constantly laying down their lives for you. Anyone ever had like a pimple? What happens there? You get this pus, right? And then what do you do with that? It's inconvenient. Just get rid of it, right? Am I right? You know what that pus is? Those are neutrophils. You know what they've done? They said, hey, there's some bacteria here. We're going to go in there and we're going to kill those bacteria. We're going to stay there until the work is done and we're going to lay down our very lives for this person's bettering, for this person's health. Praise the Lord, amen? I'm glad our immune system loves us. Bad things happen when our immune system starts to fight, starts to fight parts of the body. That's called autoimmune diseases. But... Normally, our immune system loves us. Okay, let's go on here. So, you know what an eosinophil does, right? Okay, so here is 
a blood-borne um, parasite. This is similar to malaria. And uh, this is actually animal model of malaria, Plasmodium burgi. And if you ever look at studies, research studies, they won't tell you of studies they've conducted on malaria. Why is that? Because they're not going to do studies on people with malaria. So what they do is they get this parasite, they infect animals, and th then they do the studies. And they say, okay, if it works here, it probably works for malaria in the human as well. This is pretty exciting information. What they found recently in 2011 were that curcubitacins, I'm not going to tell you what they are yet, curcubitacins fight these things and the active compounds were actually shown to inhibit the ability of the parasite to even develop. It just shuts it down in its early stages of development. You want to know where you can get curcubitacins from? Right here. Pumpkin seeds, squash seeds, it's pretty amazing, huh? And papaya seeds. Now, there have also been some studies on intestinal type worms. These are usually the parasites we think about. Um, those parasites like the tapeworm, the roundworm, the pinworm. Well, studies have found that these, the extracts from pumpkin and papaya seed are tremendously effective against these parasites. Now, why am I telling you this? Well, the reason why is because wouldn't it be nice to be able to help your immune system out every now and then? They're going to thank you. And if you help your immune system fight an, a battle that they're waging on this front, you know what they're going to be able to do then on this front? Fight more effectively. So as much as we can help them, we should be helping them. So they'll be able to be more effective when those other threats come along that let's say we don't even know about. Okay, so here's the study. It found that in 1.88 minutes and 1.93 minutes, papaya seed and pumpkin seed, respectively, actually will paralyze these worms. Did you get that? In under two minutes, the extract from papaya or pumpkin is crude extract, which means you could just chew it up and make your own extract, basically. Okay, eat it as a food. It paralyzed these worms within two minutes. Now, you know what happened if the worm was kept there in contact with this compound? Within three and a half minutes, they died after contact with papaya seeds. Pumpkin, it took a little bit longer, but after 4.9 minutes, they died after coming in contact with pumpkin seeds. That's pretty remarkable. And these things are so simple, and they're so easy, and they're so, um, usually we throw them away, don't we? We don't think there might be medicinal value in them. But studies are showing that ha they have tremendous medicinal value. And you know what? Your eosinophils might thank you for helping them out as well. You might not even need as many eosinophils, so then maybe you could have more of the natural killer cells, or more of a different type of cell to help with whatever is ailing you at that time. Here's another cell, it's called a macrophage. These are one of my most favorite cells. And the reason why is because they serve a wide variety of purposes. And one of the most important purposes they serve is that of a custodian. They're, a, they're the body's cleanup crew, basically. So for instance, if you were to have um, a macrophage, that live in the lungs, which we kind of designate different names depending on where the macrophage is found. Uh, we designate names. So in the uh, lungs, we call them alveolar macrophages. In the brain, we call them microglial cells. They function very similarly up there as well. Um, but let's just talk about this one particular one right here, the uh, pulmonary macrophage or the alveolar macrophage. Do you see what it's doing here? It's actually reaching out what looks like to be arms, and it's engulfing some kind of foreign material. Either, we don't know what it is, it could be dust, or it could be bacteria, it could be fungus, or it could even be viral infected cells. So it's just reaching out. Now, it has potentially more than just two arms. It could have many arms, depending on wherever it is. 
uh, and whatever surrounding it. It could be extending these little appendages and grabbing all kind of things. Just amazing potential. It's the largest immune cell too. And if you look at it under a microscope, it's at least twice as big as the other immune cells surrounding it. Quite amazing. Now, interesting note about the macrophages is that let's say you, um, you take a deep breath. Let's have everyone do that right now. It'd be good to do after fellowship lunch anyway. Take a deep breath. Ah, wonderful, amen? You know that just relaxed you? That just promoted digestion? And also, you just probably got a big lung full of dust as well. <laughs> And that presents a problem. You know what most dust is inside the house? 90% of it is dead skin. So think about it. And it's not yours probably. It's other people's. But that's okay. You know why? Because God has given us these cells. They're actually referred to in many cases as dust cells as well. Besides just being called macrophages. They call them dust cells. Why do you think that is? Because they'll go around, they'll clean it up. Don't worry about it too much. I mean, yes. Get fresh air. Open your windows every now and then. Let fresh air come in. Amen? Um, watch out for the dust mites, too. Because the, uh, those can be pretty bad on the lungs as well. But the macrophages will help to clean out the lungs. They'll help to keep those areas clean. But they don't just clean up the lungs. They can also clean up other areas that have um, had tissue damage occur. For instance, right here. Does anyone know what that is? Anyone? Okay. It, it doesn't really look like anything in the body. You know why? Because it doesn't belong in the body. It's dead tissue. It's actually, I believe, eight to ten days after a heart attack. That area of heart muscle cell or tissue that has died basically because of lack of oxygen. What has to happen with that now? If it just stays there, it'll rot, you'll get an infection there, and you'll die from the infection. So you know what happens? The body immediately sends in macrophages. It's kind of like sending in the Marines, and actually they really are like the Marines. They're referred to as monocytes in the bloodstream, and then when they enter into an area, they become macrophages. They change function. So uh, it, it really is like sending in the Marines. But right here, you see all these little um, dots, those are visible because someone has put a stain on this microscope slide and the stain has identified macrophages in this whole area. Look, there's swarms of macrophages here. You know what they're all doing? They're cleaning out that dead material so that you can survive and you can live longer. Isn't that amazing? Who does this? Who's the general of these things? Any idea? Well, Psalms 51.10 says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Amen. Amen? Amen? Praise the Lord, because He's the commander of our immune system army. And we're to work in cooperation with Him. Now, there are some other cells that find their residence in something we call the lymphatic system. They also, they'll come out into the blood, of course, but they're, they kind of dwell in the, uh, and mature somewhat, in the lymphatic system. Uh, so, one of these is called the T lymphocyte. Now, T lymphocyte has a number of different subcategories, and we'll talk about three of them. First of all, the killer T cell, its primary role is kind of like an infantry man. He will kill especially the viruses and cancerous cells in the body. Helper T cell works together with all the different immune cells, and it helps them to find. Um, and identify threats that are in the body. Also helps to activate. It's kind of like a sentinel. He wakes up the immune system and says, hey, there's a threat over here. We need to, we need to do something about it. And then we also have regulatory T cells, which their primary function is actually to say, hey, the battle's over. Why are we fighting still? Right? All Israel to their tents, so to speak. Because is it really important for a battle to be waging when the enemy is gone? No. It takes a lot of resources to, to run a war, right? And the same thing with the body. So the regulatory T cell has a very important role to play in decreasing the attacks of the immune system if there is nothing there for it to attack. 
All right. That being said, they work very closely with a cell called the B lymphocyte. Now the B lymphocyte is the longest lived cell, immune cell in the body. And the reason why is because you probably have B lymphocytes from your early childhood still in your lymphatic system. You know why? Anyone here immune to the chicken pox? I can say that. I'm thankful for that. You know why I'm immune to the chicken pox? Because there are some B lymphocytes that remember the, the chicken pox that are living in my lymphatic system. And so when they see chicken pox come back, you know what they do? They say, I've seen you before. And they jump into action. They replicate themselves. And all of a sudden you have an army of B lymphocytes that now are going to be producing something called antibodies. And what antibodies do is they're like sticky notes. They stick to these foreign invaders. And now the immune system says, hey, my job's easy. I don't go ha have to go and inspect everything. I already know you don't belong here, so I can take care of you and take you out from the body. So antibodies are, play a huge role in immunity. Now, that being said, there's a really interesting phenomenon that occurs, interaction that occurs between the... B lymphocyte and the helper T cell. And this is, a, there's another object lesson here I, I'll submit to you. You see, the B lymphocyte, when it's being formed, it comes out not really knowing much into the, the circulation. In fact, we call them naive B lymphocytes. Where does that word naive, what does it mean? It means you don't really know much, right? So these naive B lymphocytes come out into the circulation and they have not quite figured out what they want to be when they grow up. Okay, they just, they're just kind of hesitant. They just don't know what to do. And so what will happen is the, B, uh, the helper T cell will come along and say, hey, I found something that I don't think belongs in the body. He goes up to one of these naive um, B lymphocytes and says, hey, I want you to check this out. Look at this and they converse over it, and if it's truly something that doesn't belong in the body, you know what happens? The B lymphocyte says, thank you very much, I'll take this. And he says, I'm going to dedicate the rest of my life to fighting this one threat, and this one threat alone. They're very single-minded in their purpose, and they do a very, very good job at it. You know, of all those that survived Ebola, at least that they've studied, they've done autopsies and run laboratory reports, of all those that survived, if you were not producing, um, well, put it this way, if you were not producing antibodies, you would die from Ebola. But if you did produce antibodies, you would survive. So how important are the B lymphocytes? Extremely important. How important is it to have a healthy reaction from the helper T cells? Extremely important, right? All these immune cells are important. Not just one is more important than the other. They're all important. It's just like us. All of us are important. Each one of us has been given talents and purposes and goals by the Lord. And we need to encourage each other to meet those challenges, to meet those goals, and to fulfill those purposes. How can we do this, though, with the immune system? Well, here's one of my favorite flowers, the purple cone flower, otherwise known as echinacea. We've all known that echinacea boosts the immune system, but we recently found out how it does it. In the year 2014, a medical journal reported that echinacea boosts the immune response by, now listen to this, you know about this terminology now, so you're going to be able to figure this out too. It decreases the number and activity of T regulatory cells, first of all. What does that do? What do the T regulatory cells do? They say, hey, stop fighting right? There's no need to fight anymore. So what happens when you don't have as many of them saying, stop fighting? You have an immune boost going on, right? Okay, so that's part one of how echinacea boosts the immune response. Secondly, it increases the activity of those helper T cells that go around looking for things to bring over and show people in the immune system. Show the B lymphocytes, show the other, other uh, immune cells. So there's another aspect to immune boost. 
So the two aspects that are going on there. That being said, there's one situation where echinacea would not be advisable then. Do you know when it would be? It would be during cases of autoimmune disease. Why is that? Because if your body is fighting itself, you need all the regulatory T cells you can have. Voicing their, you know, or making their proclamation, stop fighting, stop fighting, calm down, calm down. Because if you slow those down, you could increase the, the auto, um, um, auto inflammatory or the um, autoimmune condition. And these are all a number of different autoimmune conditions right here. So what can we do if there is an autoimmune condition going on? Well, the best thing is to prevent an autoimmune condition. I'll tell you that. Scientists have found recently that there is a cell in the body called the natural killer cell. The natural killer cell, if we have low levels of these, you know what usually happens? We start to have autoimmune conditions coming up. In fact, a number across the board, a number of these autoimmune conditions, you'll also find very low levels of natural killer cells. Um, very, very interesting. There's, there, that's kind of a really, really recent insight, and there's not really a whole lot published about it, but uh, suffice it to say, the best way to prevent an autoimmune disease is probably to initially have a good amount of these natural killer cells functioning properly. Now, what do natural killer cells do? This is actually my favorite immune cell, and it's my favorite because they're so capable of fighting major threats in the body. And what I mean by major threats, I'm talking about the really powerful viruses and cancer. And on the note of cancer, if you do not have these cells, you probably will get cancer. Because these cells, they form a network of something called the tumor surveillance system. And they're very capable of tracking down and destroying cancer. You've heard of the neighborhood watch, right? Okay, imagine, imagine a high crime area and the neighborhood watch gets shut down. That's exactly what's happening when we have decreased levels of natural killer cells in the body. So how many of you would like to know how you can actually boost levels of natural killer cells? Anyone? All right. Well, here's one thing. Breathe fresh air. Studies have found that there are compounds that are exuded off of the trees, and we would refer to them just in a general uh, terminology as essential oils, right? We've heard of that before, such as these, I don't know what that is, a spruce out there possibly, or if you look a little further, maybe some pine. Um, these very fragrant trees are actually giving you a health benefit. They're giving you a blessing. Studies have found that especially the pine and the evergreen have medicinal properties. One study in Japan found that after a trip of one day into a pine forest, a group of individuals came back to their city they were dwelling in. They had their blood tested for the next seven days. You know what they found out? Natural killer cell levels were increased and activity of the natural killer cells was increased for seven days following that one exposure to the pine trees. That's amazing, isn't it? Now, if you think that's amazing, wait until you increase the effect a little bit. These same, um, uh, actually still in Japan, I'm not sure if it was the same group of researchers, but these Japanese researchers said, hey, if it works in the forest, let's see what it does when we actually have people in their homes and let's um, evaporate some essential oil in an indoor environment and see what happens because we want to find out if that's really what's causing this increase in natural killer cell levels and function. So what they did was they got a group of um, healthy male subjects age 37 to 60 and they said, hey, here's your hotel room for the next three nights. Go to work as you please, but when you come home every night, we want you to go to sleep with this vaporizer on that's going to be actually putting pine essential oil out into the air. And they actually were able to detect it in the air. You know how you can detect pine essential air, uh, oil in the air? Just take a deep breath. <laughs> you don't need some kind of complicated machine to do it. Um, but the amazing thing was after three nights exposure, after just three nights exposure, 
levels of natural killer cells and activity of natural killer cells was significantly increased for 30 days following exposure. I don't know about you, but I think that's quite remarkable. Quite remarkable. And I remember seeing something in the Ministry of Healing about pine. Do you remember that? That there are healing properties in the fragrance of the pine. So these are some of them right here. There are many others. You know, there's a compound called pinene, alpha pinene and beta pinene that are found in pine essential oil. And pinene has been found to actually penetrate in through the brain. It crosses the blood-brain barrier very quickly. And it actually slows down a process that is linked to degenerative, de degenerative diseases like uh, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and even memory impairment, um, and not cause any residual side effects. It's uh, acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, natural acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. But you know what happens if you were to have a synthetic acetylcholinesterase inhibitor? All sorts of side effects. So brothers and sisters, there are healing properties in the fragrance of the pine that we have no idea about. But I think we should start taking these admonitions by faith and moving forward. Amen? We should start really realizing that there's power in the Word of God. There's power in the admonitions in the Word of God. And there's power in our, what seems to be a simple health message. And I'll submit to you, what the world needs in preparation for these big viruses and these big uh, pandemics and even the pandemic of cancer right now is a simple message. Something as simple as going out in the pine forest and taking a walk. Or maybe something as simple as taking a nice hot shower and finishing with what? 30 seconds of cold, if you can, if you can tolerate that much. Why is that? Because scientists have found that warm, adequately warming someone and then applying cold causes significant immunostimulation, especially increasing levels of natural killer cells. How many of you like to go for walks in the wintertime? No, it's too cold, right? Brothers and sisters, if we just persevere in doing good, despite the adverse circumstances, we're going to receive an increased blessing. You know why? Studies have found that if you're warm, and you go outside and you start to exercise, and yeah, you, there may be a little brisk wind blowing, that greatly increases the number of natural killer cells. All right, so don't stay inside just because it's cold. Dress appropriately, yes, but there's a blessing to be had in persevering even though there may be some adverse um, circumstances. Here's another one, and all these things are simple, but they're profound in their effect. Another one. There is a designated time to heal. We're going to talk about this in a few minutes uh, when we pick up our next presentation. But suffice it to say, bedtime is the time to heal. You know 90% of all your healing takes place while you're sleeping? 90%. And for children, 90% of growth takes place when they're sleeping. There's a very important compound that's produced, and it can be produced in high levels if we're going to bed early on a regular basis, we're not sleeping under bright uh, floodlights. We're actually sleeping in very dimly lit or even dark environment, which would be the best. And that compound is known as melatonin. We'll talk about how to boost melatonin levels in the next presentation. But suffice it to say, melatonin has tremendous effects, positive effects on the immune system. One study found that it has quantitative and functional enhancements uh, dealing with natural killer cells. What does that mean? It means it increases the number and it and that allows them to function more appro appropriately, allows them to fight things off better. So imagine the benefits of just getting a good night's sleep. But there are many people, I'll submit to you, 90% of Americans have trouble sleep. 90% of them. And there's a very simple reason why. 90% of Americans drink the caffeine equivalent of two cups of coffee a day. And studies have found that 200 milligrams of caffeine in the morning disrupts sleep at night. It actually d disrupts slow wave sleep, which is where you're going to get a lot of these healing compounds and you're going to get a good solid night's sleep because of that. Okay, so sleep is good. Exercise. Exercise brings more immune cells into the circulation because your lymphatic system 
begins to contract. Why? Not because it can do it itself, but because the muscles around it are contracting. So exercise is very, very important for boosting the function of the immune system. There's another one here. There's an artist's depiction of a virus, and here's the um, influenza virus. Now notice there are these little pegs on its outer surface. This is your H or your N. You've heard of H1 and N1? These are referring to these pegs that are outside of the virus. You know what this is right here? It's a sugar coating. This is a sugar coated virus. Ebola is a sugar coated virus. You know why they hide themselves in sugar? Because they can camouflage themselves more effectively and they can come up to cells and present themselves and say, hey, I'm your next meal. Okay? I've got something good for you. But as we know, they don't have anything good for us, not anything that we would want. I think I have a little diagram here to show you how this works. Here we go. So they come up alongside the cell. The cell takes them in and says, okay, well, just to be safe, we'll put a little vesicle around you. But these, um, it's, viruses are kind of baffling. They're not necessarily alive. They need you to function. They need you to replicate. They're nothing without you, right? But they'll take everything from you. They don't care about you. They only care, they're very selfish. They just want to destroy you. They don't care what they have to do to reach their selfish purposes. And so this is an example of how this works. When they sense a change in pH, they split from the vesicle and they dump all their genetic material out into this fluid, which makes its way over to the, the nucleus. And it says to the cell, stop making your own things now. Only make us. Just replicate me. It's kind of like if you had a boss who left. He was a good boss. Another boss came in. And he said, okay, I want you to stop whatever you're doing now. I know you might have a regular job, but, you know, stop doing it. And I just want you to make photocopies of this picture of me for the rest of your life. Now, that sounds pretty selfish, right? It's a selfish prerogative. That's exactly what the viruses are doing, though. They take over, they hijack the nucleus, and they tell these little things over here, which are called ribosomes, only make more of us. Don't make anything else. So first of all, your cells are not going to be very healthy because they're not building the proteins they need to be healthy. And they're going to be producing these viruses, which in turn can either fill up the cell until it bursts, explodes, and these viruses go everywhere, or it can start budding out and going and infecting other cells. This sounds like a very devious project, doesn't it? These are the original terrorists right here. But I'm very thankful that God has given us remedies in nature that are profoundly effective against these things. Does anyone know what this is right here? This is elderberry. This is uh, black elderberry in particular. You just saw the flowers, now you see the berries. And uh, I'll submit to you, you need to know how to identify elderberries. Don't just go out and pick any blackberry you see growing, because you could be getting something toxic. Uh, but if you know how to, to identify elderberry, uh, it's a wonderful medicinal um, herb. Studies have found, um, this was actually in 2004, that if individuals with flu-like symptoms during flu season took elderberry, for five days, four times a day, and they compared those with the control group of people that had influenza, that were just, you know, kind of bearing with it, what they found was that the symptoms disappeared four days earlier in the group that was taking elderberry. Four, that's amazing. Four days less influenza infection? That sounds like a good idea to me. Amen? Not only did it do this, but also decreased the severity of the infection because symptoms um, decreased, but when people were, let's say they were asthmatic or they had bronchitis or something like that, and they were on an inhaler or um, they were taking something we call breakthrough medications, they had to take less, much less breakthrough medication with using elderberry, which means the whole infection was less severe. So not only the duration was less, the infection was less. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? In their um, take-home argument, they said elderberry extract seems to offer an efficient, safe, 
and cost-effective treatment for influenza. And I don't know about anybody here, but I've tried it, and it's been amazing in its effect for me as well. I was actually privileged to work with an amazing facts evangelist a few years ago. And uh, in the middle of the evangelistic series, he came down with the flu. And we were driving together every day. So I was kind of looking over at him, <laughs> coughing and sneezing. I was thinking, eh, you know, uh, I, I might have gotten it. I don't know. But um, I just had found elderberry growing in the forest behind my house. And I had made a huge batch of elder, elderberry extract. And I had consumed probably more than the normal person should consume in like a 40-day period prior to this. I didn't know anything about it. So I just, I made it and I consumed it. I thought it tasted good. Um, and so I had this little bottle left over. And I, I looked over at him and I said, you know what? You've got the flu. I've got elderberry. I heard it helps. Let me get it for you. So I gave it to him. We were driving back up uh, to our house. And he took it that night. He came to pick me up the next morning. He said, Ron, I'm 100% better. I'm a believer in elderberry. And he said, you know what? They, they make lozenges with elderberry. They make cough syrup with elderberry. They make this. He became an overnight expert in elderberry <laughs> because it helped him so much. And you know what? That evangelistic series went on. And people, up until like uh, even a year ago, people were still being baptized from that evangelistic series. So I praise the Lord for these kind of things. Amen? For these simple remedies God has placed in nature. And these things are cost effective, uh, especially if you have them growing in your own backyard. Uh, but even if you're just going to your local health food store, they're very cost effective and profoundly physiologically effective as well. Interesting thing about how elderberry works. And um, this is something that I won't spend too much time on, but I think you'll find it interesting as well. These little um, cellular members, the ribosomes, they will produce viruses if the DNA gets uh, infected, or the um, nucleus gets infected with a virus. They'll start to produce the virus for it. Wouldn't it not be nice to be able to just shut these down? To shut down the factory and say, hey, everybody go home. No one's making anything bad anymore. Well, studies have found that elderberry has ribosomal deactivating proteins. Three different types, actually, I believe, of ribosomal deactivating proteins. Now, the amazing thing about this is they won't go into the cell and deactivate ribosomes in a normal, healthy person but they appear to be able to deactivate the ribosomes of infected cells. And I believe the reason why is because elderberry has a really interesting protein. It's called a lectin. It's, some, it's a protein that sticks to a sugar, and a particular type of sugar. And this sugar just happens to be on the membrane of viruses such as influenza and Ebola. And studies have found that this elderberry lectin interacts with the Ebola glycoprotein structure. Now let's talk about influenza though. What does it do? It potentially can bind to the uh, influenza. And so when that influenza goes into the cell, it brings the cure with it. Amen? It's just absolutely amazing what God has done in nature. And he made this with you and I in mind. It's not just by coincidence that these things happen. Pharmacists, Research pharmacists are giving up in studying complex chemical formulations. They're saying, hey, we need to go to nature now and study natural compounds and then synthesize them so we can sell them for much more, unfortunately, sometimes than the natural product itself. But the amazing thing about this is you can easily find a lot of research nowadays on natural products showing their efficacy, studied efficacy, in various disease uh, processes. So it's really an exciting time to be alive for people who are interested in natural remedies. So much information out there about these things, about how they work. Okay, now we know things that are beneficial for the immune system, things that can help fight viruses, fight infections. We know the benefits of natural killer cells, but what could we be doing potentially that could be impairing the natural killer cell function? Let's talk specifically again about natural killer cells. This is natural killer cells' worst enemy right here. It's called benzopyrene. 
Benzopyrene not only is a cancer-causing agent, but it also will directly shut down natural killer cells. It'll stop them in their tracks and decreases their number and their function. You know where many people get natural uh, benzopyrene from? From smoking. Benzopyrene is found in tobacco products. Not just smoking, it's also found in uh, the oral type of tobacco, like the tobacco chew or the snuff and all those things. What happens is the benzopyrene gets absorbed into the oral mucosa and it actually starts the whole cascade of shutting down the natural killer cells all throughout the body. So what do you have? You have a body that's defenseless against the inroads of cancer because of tobacco usage. But I'll submit to you, that's not the number one, um, the number one source of benzopyrene for the average American. Smoking is somewhat on the decline. There's still millions of people that do it, but a lot of people are becoming more and more aware of the, the detrimental properties of smoking. But did you realize that the highest levels of benzopyrene actually come from our diet? In particular, char-broiled meats. Char-broiled meat, just one char-broiled steak, has more benzopyrene than several cartons of cigarettes. So what do you think that does to our natural killer cell levels? Drops them. We learned about autoimmune diseases, right? When do we get autoimmune diseases? When our natural killer cell levels are low, right? When do we get cancer? When our natural killer cell levels are low. So I'll submit to you, it's a tough thing to give up, but I'll submit to you that with Jesus Christ in our lives, all things are possible. And it would behoove us to prayerfully consider making steps, even baby steps. At least we're going forward, amen? But at least making steps to improve the function of our immune system. We don't want to wait until we've already got a disease to try to do something about it. That's not the ideal. The ideal is to prevent. Here's another thing that is uh, very, very deadly uh, for natural killer cells, and that's alcohol. Studies have found that alcohol suppresses activation of natural killer cells by suppressing the whole response of natural killer cells. So the, these soldiers cannot respond they, they're kind of inebriated themselves with just a low dose of alcohol. Now you've heard the, the old adage, well it's a new adage, a wine a day for the heart, a glass of wine a day for the heart. I'll submit to you this. Wine in and of itself is not beneficial to the heart. There are beneficial compounds in the wine that can be beneficial to the heart, such as the resveratrol, which is a very potent antioxidant. But it's also found in the grapes. How many of you like grapes? Anyone here? Now, if it was grape season, and I was in your house, and you said, Ron, I want you to go buy me some grapes, and get me the, you know, the black or the red grapes. Those are my favorite. And I said, okay, I'll go get you some grapes. And I come back with something looking like this. Would you be happy? No, why is that? What's wrong with this grape? Uh, okay, there's something obviously wrong with this grape, right? But hold on, there's resveratrol in this grape. It's got some good stuff in it. It's not even a raisin. <laughs> it's, it's really a rotten grape. Okay, it's a sour grape. The Bible talks about the children have eaten sour grapes. We don't want to give our children sour grapes. We want to give them the whole beneficial package. And for that same reason, we don't want people to drink wine for prevention purposes. Because it's, got, it's, the, same, it's the same logic as eating uh, rotten grapes. In fact, at least here you'll get some fiber. So next time you hear someone say, drink a glass of wine for your heart, keep in mind that the best place to get it is where? from the original source, the unadulterated source. And the amazing thing about grapes, regular grapes, is they're not going to inhibit the natural killer cells. They actually promote the natural killer cells. All right, whereas the alcohol 
decrease the function of natural killer cells? Listen to this. Resveratrol, absent of alcohol, completely decreases the risk, uh, the platelet aggregation decreases the risk of heart attack. So there you've got your heart benefit. But also increases cytotoxic activity, meaning the, the availability of the natural killer cells to fight off invaders using its uh, chemical weaponry of natural killer cells and thus increase susceptibility of tumor cells to natural killer cells. So where's the best place to get the resveratrol? Obviously it's from the fresh grapes as God intended it to be. Okay, now here's another interesting factor in natural killer cell levels. These are the benefits of a merry heart. There was a group of people actually still in Japan. The Japanese, for some reason, are very, very interested in studying natural killer cells. I wish that we really, in terms of everyone, would start getting interested in this. Why is that? Because they're so vital for our health. But the study done in Japan found that one hour of recreational music making in an older or elderly group actually significantly increased levels of natural killer cells and the whole gamut of, of uh, immune cells and inter, interferon, uh, which is kind of like a wake-up call for the body to start an inspection of all the cells in the, in the local area that's affected. But just a tremendous immune boost by just one hour of recreational music making. Now this, I have to kind of qualify this advice, because what they did was they didn't set an elderly person down and say, okay, practice Mozart for one hour. I want you to be proficient in it. I want to come back and find everything perfectly played. Okay, you know what would have probably happened if that person had never played anything before? They probably would have had a decreased number of immune cells. Uh, but they were told, here, here's a glockenspiel, or here's a harmonica, I want you to just play it. And make up a song. Just take your mind off your troubles. Okay? There's a lot of power in terms of health promotion in taking our minds off of our troubles. Tremendous power. Conversely, there's a lot of negativity or negative effects associated with depressive states and anxious states. For instance, a number of studies have found that if a person is depressed even mildly, they'll have a mild depression of natural killer cells. And as that person moves more into more severe depression, you know what happens? More severe depression of natural killer cells. So the more depressed you get, the less able you're, you are to fight viruses, the less able you are to fight cancer, and no wonder so many people that have depression end up coming down with cancer later on. Because there's the connection right there. There's the connection. And brothers and sisters, millions of people in this country have depression. And I'll say probably even more people go unidentified. You and I can have depression. You know that? You and I might be even depressed right now. But there's one solution to depression, ultimately, that goes far beyond anything that we can do for ourselves. And that is looking unto Jesus who will never let us down, never let us go. And his love for us is unfathomable and unrelenting. What was that song that we um, all enjoyed in the beginning? A Merry Heart. What does it say? A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but what? A broken spirit does what? Drieth the bones. Brothers and sisters, do you remember where the immune system originates from? From the bones. The Bible is always light years ahead of its time. And it's time we started picking it up more often and not only reading about it, not only theorizing about it, but putting into practice these simple things that we're learning. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's close with a word of prayer. We'll have our break and then we'll continue. Um, what are we scheduled for in terms of the break? Ten minutes. Okay, shall we have a word of prayer? I know some of you probably have to head back. Dear Father in heaven, we pray that you would please be with us and that you would help us truly to not only uh, assent to the truth of the need that we have for you, but help us to embrace the truth. 
Help us to truly seek you more earnestly. And we pray that you would give us the gift of your Holy Spirit. There are some here that might have to leave, that might not be able to attend the rest of the seminar. I pray you would be with them, that you would keep them safe as they travel home. And that you would help us all to remember that we are all on a journey home. Help us not to be dissuaded. Help us not to turn to the left hand or to the right hand, but help us to keep going forward. Help us to see you high and lifted up. And by beholding you, become changed into your image. We thank you, and we ask this would be done not only in our, uh, for our spiritual needs, but also for our mind and even our very body. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.